Michael, welcome to the Content 10X podcast. Yeah, hi, Amy. It's great to great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. No, thank you so much for coming on. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> so to kick the um to kick this episode off, Michael, you've had such a interesting career. I just wanted to ask you if you could share a brief summary of that, really. So a brief summary of, you know, where you started and, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just briefly. I mean, I started in my career in sales, actually, uh, working for the Nielsen Company and um, selling uh, market research information to the world's you know, most uh, recognized brands, you know, so I, I feel like I really learned marketing, you know, kind of the, the classic four P's from some of the best brands in the world. Um, but I, fo I followed my my frustrations really into marketing. I didn't feel like as a salesperson, I was getting the support I was looking for or had hoped for. Um, and then really, you know, have been in marketing and stayed in marketing ever since, uh, you know, kind of back and forth between startups and and large corporations, you know, like like SAP, where I was uh, my last corporate role as head of uh, content marketing for them globally, uh, and then you know started my own agency uh, in 2013, and have been uh, really you know focused on helping both you know larger brands as well as startups and you know smaller smaller companies uh, really implement the kind of marketing that I think works, and and with a real focus on ROI, and and you know kind of leaning back on my sales experience. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's been a wild ride. It has. Yeah. And, um, I was really interested, um, in the, the talk that you delivered at content marketing world back in September, when we were, we were both out there in Ohio, um, so much so that I, I wanted to invite you on the podcast, to have a little bit more of a talk about all the useful insights that you shared. Um, so one of the things that you said in your talk was that, um, 60 to 70% of content that we create goes completely unused. Um, like, why is that? So created, but not used, like what, what are the main reasons that that tends to happen in your opinion? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of my, uh, tweetable, tweetable quotes, uh, if you will, but, and, and you heard me say it, but, um, you know, I always say behind every, you know, piece of content that never gets used is an executive who asked for it. And, <laughs> you know, one of the biggest frustrations I had as an, as a, as a corporate marketer, was you know being sort of you know it's kind of like a rock in a hard place where you're you're expected to deliver results for the business for sales or you know to bring in leads um but then you're asked to do things that don't deliver on those sales results or leads um and so that's what i think happens you've got the you know the vp of product says hey we need a you know a whole campaign to you know announce the launch of our new product and then the vp of sales says hey i want a brochure or you know uh, you know, some kind of a, a piece of content for my sales organization. And, you know, executives all over the organization think that just because they have an opinion that they can ask for content and then marketers often can't say no, they go and create it. And, um, you know, oftentimes without a real plan for distribution. So it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's something that, you know, I found most marketers will, will initially say, no, that can't be true. It's not, it's, that doesn't happen in our organization, but in almost every organization where there's been a, an audit, uh, we found that marketing content, you know, 60 to 70% gets created and never used. Yeah, it's a shame. Well, yeah, but then again, the maybe the reasons behind why it was created, perhaps it's not a shame, but it's a lot of wasted effort. So mm -hmm. ends up being this disconnect between also what we publish and what our customers want. And, you, you know, you want to hit that sweet spot of what your customers want and what you actually publish. So anything that isn't in that sweet spot, that falls outside of what they want or or what you publish. Do you consider that really to be noise or wasted effort? I guess from the the teams. Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, I think there are things like you have to do. You know, I always say like product people are not bad. You know, their their focus is on the product, and and it's like you know their children. They love those babies that they want to care and nurture for them and tell the whole world about them. Um, and you can't not create that kind of content, you know, that explains what your product is and the features and benefits and differentiators. Um, so I don't think there's it's necessarily a bad thing. The problem is, is that most most buyers are only ready for that at the very, very end of the, you know, the buyer's journey. And so one of the things I've been doing for the last 10 years of my, my career is really trying to point out to brands that, that the, there's this huge gap of, of helpful educational content that really meets the needs of, of your customers. And it helps you to attract them to the things that you've created that talk about who you are and what you sell and what, why you're better. Um, 
And, you know, I, 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 I use the Venn diagram in my presentation in, in Cleveland, but to kind of show like, you know, there's the circle of stuff we think we should do and the circle of stuff that our customers actually want. And, and it's not to say that the circle over here is bad. It's just that brands don't create enough of the stuff that buyers actually want. And like a great example of this, I was on a call with a client the other day and he was challenging that some of the content we were creating for them wasn't in the buyer's journey because he was perceiving the buyer's journey as somebody who's ready to buy today. And, you know, for example, um, when I was at SAP, the most converting blog article we ever wrote was how to be a better manager. And we sold and got more leads for ERP software from an article about how to be a better manager than we did in articles about ERP software. And it's just a great counterintuitive, I think, example of when we meet people and their biggest challenges, we attract them to our brand so that they can check out our products. Um, but when we just talk about our products, we, you know, I think people run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair enough. And I think I've definitely observed that as well. <laughs> um, yeah. And so in terms of like the, the answering those right questions then, so, you know, knowing what people, uh, what our ideal clients are wanting to know at that earlier stage in the, the, the funnel and the journey. Um, are there any like tools or like, you know, techniques that you would recommend for trying to get the, the, the questions that we should be answering? Yeah, there's a number of tools that I think are, are widely available to anyone in the world. And, and, you know, I talk about the benefits of the digital world that we live in. You know, we all leave a, a footprint in the, the searches that we make and the content we consume and the things that we share. And so um, I think it's, it's, you know, sort of, uh, it's really something that whether you're a small business owner or you're a marketer in a large corporation, we all should be thinking about how to take advantage of these tools. And so just a couple of quick examples, Google trends, you know, uh, you just Google Google trends and you can find it. You can see, you can see like, for example, you know, when I was at SAP, there's a big debate between, should we talk about big data or should we talk about cloud computing? And it was easy to go in Google trends and say, well, they're both important, but one is, you know, has a little more traction, a little more search volume than the other. So that's, you know, it's, it's a way to settle sort of internal fights maybe about what's more important. Um, BuzzSumo is a great tool. It, it does cost a little bit of money, but it'll show you if you type in a keyword or a competitor's website, for example, it'll tell you all the most shared content on that keyword or website, which is just a great insight to what are people sharing? What are people engaging with on social media platforms? Um, another one that I love is, is a tool called Answer the Public, uh, yeah. answerthepublic.com which I think was just bought by Neil Patel. Um, but it um, it's totally free. You can type in any keyword and it gives you all of the sort of prepositions that people use. So, you know, if, if we're talking about cloud computing, it'd be, what is cloud computing? Why is cloud computing important? How do I implement cloud computing? Who sells cloud computing? So it's all the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions that audiences are asking around any topic. And it also presents it in a kind of a mind map to visual way. So it's like, you know, I always say it's like an editorial plan on a page, um, and that's a completely free tool. Uh, we at our agency, we use uh, SEMrush or SEMrush. Um, they have a topic modeling tool that we use that also creates kind of a mind map and kind of, you know, tells you what questions people are asking. But I think, you know, the point is there's plenty of tools out there um, and we can, you know, you can share them in your show notes. Uh, but I think what I find is you know, using the tools isn't the problem. Knowing that those tools exist and that we should be using them is really the thing that I try to preach and, and you know, have people think, you know, your opinion isn't as important as what the data, you know, can show us in the digital world that we live in. And so we can understand the questions our audiences are asking and see the content they're consuming. Um, and we should all, we should all strive to create more of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, in my uh, the other show that I have, B two B content strategist, where we look a little bit more at like the marketing departments within B two B businesses and what they keep in house, what they outsource, like uh, campaigns that have gone well. When in season one, um, one of the sort of big takeaways from what do you outsource was most of the people that I spoke to outsourced SEO, so outsourced um, a lot of the SEO research and. The, the, the actual kind of optimization and article writing as well is that something that you find uh, as well that it's a, a very um i suppose identifiable part of the marketing spectrum that does tend to get outsourced to specialists yeah i mean i think um you know seo is a very very specific skill set and yeah um and it's changed a lot really over the last 10 years because you know uh, for those of you know for those of your audience who don't really understand the way that 
the Google algorithm has changed is it basically used to be very technical, very semantic, very, you know, is there an H1 tag and a meta description and an alt tag and all of those things are have kind of become they're built into the to the word, you know, WordPress type CMSs that websites use. Um so they come out of the box. So, you know, 90, 95, almost, you know, 99% of the technology required for SEO success is already built into the platforms people are using. What, what has happened is Google's basically saying, we're going to rank content that people seem to like. And so all you need to do is really understand how to create the kind of content that people like. And so a lot of, you know, outsourced SEO firms and, and you know, we're not an SEO firm. We sort of use components of SEO uh, along with, you know, quality content uh, production to to generate, you know, the kind of content that audiences want. But SEO firms are still really important in, you know, trying to h- help companies understand, you know, which pages should be connected to each other, internal yeah. linking strategies and all those kinds of things. So, yeah, I think for the, you know, everything but the largest companies out there, SEO is, is a, you know, something that, that, you know, probably should be outsourced to the experts. Yeah, I agree. But as you said, there are lots of great tools as well. And I think when you combine it all together, um, it should be, you know, it's it's something that shouldn't be ignored. A lot of focus often goes to social. And I think not enough focus often goes towards like the SEO aspects of uh, content. Um, Something else you mentioned in your talk at Content Marketing World um, is that you, as you know, for your content, um, you create around kind of two new articles. Is it a week and then one updated um yeah so it, it interested me the updated so is this where you are doing your research using like the tools that you said and, and spotting opportunities where okay we've already done content on that but perhaps we're not ranking and then you go in and optimize in those pieces i mean it's a little bit of that uh, mm-hmm. m- most of it is um so you know we create two new pieces each week yeah. based on the kind of topic modeling and gaps and we look at competitors and stuff like that but the other you know we do two we do two updated articles each week and a lot of times it's um it's you know articles with dates from previous years uh we do a lot of that um we do and we, we do about two a week as you said we look at articles that used to rank but don't anymore um you know if we had an seo firm doing you know deep analysis they'd probably have uh, you know an algorithm like i i just don't want to misrepresent like it's really just us looking at stuff and being like oh that was an article that used to rank really well and now it doesn't anymore maybe we should just give it a little bit of a refresh and 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 update it with a new image a new date you know some new stats and information um so it's uh you know it's probably like a 25 percent refresh not a full rewrite um, we look at some things that sometimes we stumble over a, an article I wrote in, you know, 2013, that's 450 words. I'm like, okay, I need to rewrite this and get it to 1200 words. And I have it actually answer the search intent. Um, but yeah, it's, it's almost like a rabbit hole, to be honest. Like we stumble upon things that we know should be updated and then we go update them. Yeah. Same here. We do that as well. And like you said, sometimes it's just tweaks of old out of date stats or defunct yeah. platforms and things like that and often it's a little bit more <laughs> um mm-hmm. so in terms of you know kind of moving on from how the ways that we reach our audience so when we have managed to reach obviously a next important step is the the engagement and the conversion um what kind of uh, mistakes do you see people make when it comes to to that step to so the, the engage and convert aspects yeah mm. Yeah, this is a conversation I'm having a lot recently with, you know, clients who, you know, we're all fearing, I think, feeling the, you know, the fear and uncertainty of the economy and pressures. And I, I was telling telling my wife the other day, I feel like people are getting mean again. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stress and pressure in in, in the marketing uh, function these days. And, and so we're having a lot of those conversations. The biggest mistake that I see, and, and we, we, we have a client who, um, you know, every couple of months are like, where are the leads? Where are the leads? And we keep pointing out that they have a newsletter sign up on their on their homepage and I've signed up for it, but I've never received an email. And um, I like to, you know, most people think of engagement as like time on site and bounce rate or even social shares. I think of engagement as identifying the people that are on your site that are that are engaged. And the best way to do that is ask them to subscribe to a newsletter. So you have to ask them to subscribe. You need to then fulfill on that subscription with a newsletter. Uh, MailChimp does one for free. I I don't remember if I talked about that in Cleveland. Um, So you can set up basically an RSS completely automated newsletter. Uh, You know, so there's, you can get people to sign up using a form. And then every day that you publish a new article, it'll go out to your list. 
and it's completely automated. So for our, you know, B2B startups out there, um, you know, it's a great little, you know, kind of growth hack, if you will, for starting to identify the names of people that are engaging in your, in your stuff. The second step is, is a little bit harder, but, you know, 75% of our leads come from the nurturing of those names. So we have, you know, we have a number of places we try to capture names. We have, you know, ebook downloads and webinar recording downloads and um, the newsletter, but then we have like a 12 step email series and it started, I think with five and then it was seven and then it was nine and now it's 12. Like we just keep adding additional nurture steps, but you know, we kind of go back and forth a little bit between, Hey, you know, here's a little bit about who we are and I have four kids and, you know, they ask lots of questions. Do you have any questions for me is the first email that we send out. And then the second email I think is, um, you know, here's the top five posts from the last year on our website. And then the third is, Hey, we sell a weekly blog subscription service. Do you want to subscribe to it? You know, and then we go back to content and personal stories and a sales message. Um, but I think those are the two biggest mistakes is one capturing engagement, the names of people that are engaging and two nurturing them till, you know, basically till they become, you know, interested in speaking to you, try, you know, trialing your software, speaking to a salesperson, whatever the right sort of conversion point is for your business. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and you mentioned something and you'll talk about um, the, the real importance of having an awareness of the high traffic pages that you have and making sure that they are linking to those high converting pages. Do you have any advice on, you know, how you would go about that? It sounds so obvious, doesn't it? Link your high traffic pages to your high converting pages. But I think things like this are quite easily missed and perhaps people don't know, well, how, how would I actually do that? Have you got any tips for that? This is, this is the buyer journey uh, conversation I was having with a client the other day. So we rank on the, on the first page, I think we're number five or seven, maybe for what is marketing, which is a very broad very general, very non-buyer journey specific kind of question. Like it's students and consultants and non-marketers asking that question. Um, and it's our highest traffic page. We actually get something like 18% of our traffic comes from that one article. Obviously not very relevant to what we sell, not very you know high converting, but it's very high traffic. So if you go to that page on our website, you'll see I have a number of calls to action. Like, you know, hey, check out our a uh, content marketing strategy template, which is our top converting page. Or, hey, maybe you want to click here to download our webinar on, which is basically, you know, a webinar based on the talk I gave in, in Cleveland. And so, you know, we've tested these different sort of, you know, tripping points, if you will, for taking a high traffic page and linking it to high converting assets or pages. And then we do the opposite with the high converting page. So the content marketing strategy template page, which is our highest converting, highest lead performing page, also links to the what is marketing page. So as I said in my speech, you bring traffic to conversion and conversion to traffic. And that's really the best way to raise the bar on both of those measures. You want to reach as many people as you can and convert as many people as you can. So, you know, just do a Google analytics report on what's my top, you know, traffic page and, and then do a Google analytics report on what's my top converting page. If, if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, I don't know how to do that. I always forget how to do it. And I just Google it and it takes like three seconds to see, oh, you do one, two, three steps in Google analytics, and then you can see your, your top uh, converting landing pages. So it's, it's not very difficult. No, good old Google and YouTube tutorials always solve these problems very quickly. Don't they? And it's always exactly. easier than you think. I think Google analytics does sometimes look a little bit over bearing and, and quite technical. And then when you watch a, a tutorial, it's like, oh, actually it looks a bit more complicated than it is. So, yeah. um, no, that, I, I really like that advice. Um, in terms of uh, the different formats of content, so um, when you have a focus on, like, you know, for example, blog, blog posts, articles, the written content on your website, um, do you have any sort of techniques or advice that you follow for getting that content into a format for social media? So kind of repurposing aspects of it to bring traffic from some of the social platforms over to your website. Yeah, this is one of the, um, it's a great question. And it's one of the things that I get into a little bit of trouble with um, because I'm, I'm a little bit of a troublemaker, Amy, as you maybe have, have, have sensed, but um, it just, it comes down to the data. And, um, you know, and I mentioned this in my talk, less than 2% of traffic to B2B websites comes from social media. And I have nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with, you know, social media, you know, opinions about Elon Musk aside. Um, the, you know, even LinkedIn, I mean, LinkedIn used to, LinkedIn alone used to bring me 5% of my traffic. And now it's, it's, you know, part of the 
I think I get 3%, you know, LinkedIn brings two and I think Twitter brings 1% for my, for my website. And I think we're pretty good at social media. So my first tip, to, especially to small business owners is don't make your first marketing hire a social media person because you're, you're chasing that 2%. You're not chasing the 76% of traffic that comes from organic search. Um, and so, but it's also, I still think it's important and so um, one of the trip, tricks that I talk about is trying to automate it as much as you can. So we use Hootsuite. Um, there's an RSS plugin to Hootsuite, which is a social media platform. Um, it's not very expensive. I think we spend maybe $49 a month on it, um, but there's an RSS plugin. So I plug in our RSS feed. So the basically our website RSS feed. Um, I connect my and my team's uh, social media accounts on LinkedIn and Twitter, um, and it auto shares all of the posts as soon as they go out. Now, I also recommend my team and I, we go in and, you know, we'll add some personal commentary in some of the comments if we see some traction, but at least then we're sharing everything automatically. And then we wait and see, are there some some posts that are getting traction on LinkedIn? Well, maybe I'll go in and I'll say, hey, you know, at Amy Woods, maybe you should check out this post, that, you know, related to the thing you were saying the other day. And, you know, I'll start to drive engagement that way, but I only wait, spend my time after I see the kind of, you know, whether there's initial engagement from automation. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting what you said about, you know, the focus and not immediately going for that social media hire because that that statistic is so low for social because I think it is a mistake that we see a lot of uh, content and marketing teams make, which is just to put too mu much emphasis on the social, isn't it? And the, the social bringing people to your website. What's your opinion on paid as well? So um through uh i don't mean paid social but um you know google adwords like um paid search and mm -hmm. that method. yeah i mean it's it's um i mean i used to run paid search when i was in one of my roles at sap and and i actually loved it because um when you know when you use first touch attribution like a lot of companies do because it's the easiest the things at the top of the funnel get a lot of credit. So paid search is one of those things. The website is another one of those things. Um, you know, webinar recordings are another one of those things. So I managed all of those. So I was like, you know, the hero uh, only because I was getting the benefit of first touch attribution, which for those of you who don't know, means what's the first thing somebody does in your marketing activity that gets credit for ultimately something becoming a lead or a sale. And so um, one of the things that I found is, um, if you if if you're a company out there, whether you're small or big, and you're seeing ROI from paid search, you should never turn it off. Like I would never say to stop doing, you know, any kind of marketing activity that's delivering a return on investment. The the challenge is a lot of companies can very quickly overspend and and achieve not you know a, a, no ROI from their from their paid search investments or other paid investments. Um, but you know something like. Uh, you know, your brand versus a competitor brand. That's a great search term to buy an ad for because someone is, they're looking for you versus your competition. They're in the buyer journey. They're ready to make a purchase. You should probably, you know, be able to show some ROI from showing an ad to that, to that keyword. What we try to say is that organic search, what we do is really trying to, um, to help you save money on spending, um, you know, on spending on paid ad words that do not convert. And so we want to bring traffic in that's early stage. It's the opposite of late stage. You know, we want to bring people in in the beginning parts of their buyer journey so that we can start to engage them with your brand and get them to convert, you know, later on. So um, I do I do think paid is important. I think it's good to balance paid and organic. Um, I think any brand that's seeing ROI should continue spending on, the, on those platforms, but look to balance where there is non-ROI producing keywords, for example, or ads with, you know, organic search traffic. Yeah, try and make sure that you get a, a, a good balance and don't just go all in on one or the other. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, just like circling back to something that you mentioned before that just, I guess, kind of came up again around um, different stages of the buyer journey and people who were right at the point of ready to buy versus the, you know, the more sort of general uh, non-product specific content at first. Um, when you're planning your content, so when you're developing, say, a, a, a content plan for the year, are you trying to make sure that you're um, planning out that journey? So if they are going to land in on these more sort of top of funnel, you know, where does each article take their, that persona to who read that article to get to the next stage? So is that how you tend to plan your content out? We, we do, but it's not as um, it's not as intentional as I think you laid it out. And, mm -hmm. and, and I, the reason I say that is 
I think a lot of marketers will spend, I've seen, I, I, I have like a, I wrote an article um, that buyer personas are great except when they suck. And one of the things that I think is wrong with buyer personas, they're great when they identify the types of content and the interests of your buyer. Just, you know, getting that out of the way. Where I think they tend to have, have problems is when marketers think that they can really understand and define the stages of the buyer journey and, and target each of them. What I have found, and, and the data really proves this, is when we do capture demand in the market, it's because we've gotten lucky. And I don't mean lucky like we won the lottery. I just mean, you know, we generally, we do our best to try to identify the questions, the keywords at, at each stage of the buyer journey. We create lots of content, most of which doesn't perform well. Um, but you can never guess and know ahead of time which ones do. And that's why that's why I think campaigns are you really get marketers into trouble because you're almost making a huge bet on a, on a message. And a lot of times the message just doesn't resonate. But with content marketing, I feel like you're just saying, we're going to try to create content on all stages of the buyer journey, all the questions that the buyers are asking. And in general, what we find is that a good 20, 25% of those messages really resonate. You capture people in the early stage. You know, as long as you're presenting middle stage content for all the early stage traffic, you're generally able to get deeper, you know, deeper, deeper engagement. As long as, you're, as long as you're presenting some sort of call to action, talk to a salesperson, you know, uh, trial your software, whatever it may be, you know, you'll, you'll tend to find that you get conversion. But I think it's I think it's egotistical for marketers to believe that they can map that journey with one piece here and one piece there. And I'm going to put this thing over here. You know, we try to basically identify, like I said, all of the keywords, all of the questions, all of the content. We look at balancing things like high volume keywords with um, high purchase intent keywords. Or we look at, I love competitive gap and CPC. I mentioned this in my talk in Cleveland. Competitive gap is my agency uh, underperforms on a keyword versus a competitor, a competitive agency. So I target that keyword just so that I'm doing better than they are. Um, we, we like to do that. And that seems to work with our, with our clients. The other thing is CPC. So um, what I mean by that is when you do keyword research, the, um, the tools will tell you what are people spending on those keywords to put ads in front of them. And so that's the cost per click. And so we look at high CPC keywords with the assumption that advertisers are spending more on those because they convert. And so we have a good mix of high CPC, you know, keywords that we target. And what we find again, is that it's, you know, that constant sort of trying to balance between high volume, high conversion, um, you know, competitive gap, purchase intent, all those kinds of things. You know, I, I wish I had the magic answer, but I do think it's more like a recipe that we're, you know, constantly tweaking and it tends to create something that, you know, works. Yeah, you know, that, that really makes sense. So yeah, thank you. Great advice there. <laughs> um, final question for you. So for the year ahead, um, what's the uh, sort of biggest tip that you would give in terms of maybe a underrated technique or a tool that's not very well known or just something that people um, should be aware of for the for the year, the year ahead in content marketing yeah i mean i th i think um doing a realistic assessment about where you sit in your industry uh from an organic reach perspective and and the reason i say this is you know i've had lots of conversations with clients that are saying hey you know Budgets are tight, revenues down, profits are being squeezed, and you know we're thinking about making a cut. Um, is you know when you cut advertising, for example, the results that you get go to zero the day you cut it. But with content marketing, you know we're building kind of an you know a, a platform that's based on evergreen content that continues to meet the needs of, of of you know of your customers, and so it's an investment. It really is. And so, you know, my advice to content marketers out there is to really do an honest assessment, not how am I doing, but how am I doing relative to the competition? How do I, what, what is the visibility that I have in the industry? And should we be doing a better job? And, and invest to that answer, invest to that level. You know, if, you're, if your market share is number one, but your organic search position is number three, then you have a big gap that, you know, is probably due to underinvestment. Um, and then really just, you know, the best way to, to close that gap is just by focusing on, on customer you know, keywords and questions and content. And, and that's really, I think, I just think we're going to see a lot more of that than we're going to see, you know, I don't think brands are ready to start increasing their investment in paid. And so I think organic is going to see another good year for 2023.
Yeah, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It's been a fantastic conversation, Michael. Thank you so much. I know um, you've shared, you know, so much valuable advice and everyone's going to get so much from this episode. Um, where would you like people to go to um, to connect with you? Yeah, just uh, check out our website, marketinginsidergroup.com. But to connect, I mean, I'd love to, you know, send me a note on LinkedIn. Um, if folks are interested in getting a copy of the slides from our from our, my presentation in Cleveland, I'm happy to, to share those as well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, Amy, it's been great, great conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I'll, I'll put links to everything in the show notes. And uh, yeah, it's been great. So thank you.